so the topic of this video which you're watching right now and hopefully continue to watch is on debunking the William Webb Ellis myth and the William Webb Ellis myth is on how rugby was created now as this is the subject of this video I'm going to have to use some notes because I'm going to be talking on about pinpoints in history which happened like uh, over a hundred years ago 150 years ago even sometimes 200 or 300 years ago so I'm going to have to use some notes because I don't actually remember all of these um, points um, quite precisely and um, the notes have actually come from my book which I've used I've used them notes to write this book and it's called the phenomenal geographical spread of rugby league in the British Isles now that's just a working title I've not come up with the official title yet so um, we're saying that I think it's best to start this video with elucidating exactly what is the Will and Webb Ellis myth and in order to do that I'm going to play this video by none other than John Wayne where he explains what the Will and Webb Ellis myth is oh it's a fine game football noble game originated in England in 1823 an enterprising young man named William Webb Ellis, who studied for the ministry, by the way, found his team behind in a soccer game. So he picked up the ball and ran through the amazed opponents for a thoroughly illegal touchdown. And that's how football was born, illegitimately. So now that you know what the William Webb Ellis myth is, if you didn't before, I want to go on to how it came to be into society or the nascence of the myth, I should say. And who was the first person to propagate this myth into the environment of England? Or the environment, I should say, of rugby school? Now, the answer to that question is Matthew Bloxham. Now, if you don't know who Matthew Bloxham is, he's an old rugby school pupil. And he was the first person to write about it and he wrote about it in rugby school's newspaper called the Metro and he did this in 1877. Now this was the first time that he wrote about it but it wouldn't be the last time as he wrote about it again and doubled down on this story in 1880. Now the problem with this is that at the time Rugby school did not believe this myth and they didn't believe this myth because they asked the pupils if they remember this incident happen, happening and they asked the pupils of or they asked the classmates of William Webb Ellis whether they remember this situation going on and they didn't remember it not only did they not remember it but they did not remember him even playing rugby football whatsoever and he was actually a key cricket player and people did remember him playing cricket now we know about this because they got asked in it in an inquiry in 1895 and this was the inquiry which later on that did actually endorse the Bloxham theory but we actually have the minutes of that inquiry and no one remembers him actually doing this whatsoever and it does seem to be that they've accepted the myth because it's convenient so collective memory loss is not the only um, whole within this narrative within this myth one could say these are so contradictions within the timeline one of these contradictions is that Matthew Bloxham the guy who first wrote about this myth and published it in rugby schools newspaper the Meteor in 1877 left the school in 1821 now this supposed incident happened in 1823 so what that means is that Matthew Bloxham 
wasn't a first eyewitness. And the only way he could have obtained um, this information is by word of mouth. Now, the problem with that is that no one remembers this situation going on. None of his classmates remember it. And we know that because we've got the minutes for the inquiry where they actually state on record that they don't remember this going on and they don't even remember him playing football. So, how could it be spread word of mouth if the people who then spread it by word of mouth don't know that it happened? The people who were um, in the best location at the best time to be a first-hand witness don't remember it going on. So that's the one contradiction in the timeline. Another one is Tom Brown's School Days. Now, Tom Brown's School Days is a book, quite a famous book, which was published in 1857. Now, this book is about rugby schools, um, the, about the school days of the decade of the 1830s. Now, it actually goes through the rules of rugby football in this book as one part of a myth is true. And um, what that part is, is that rugby football was once a dribbling code of folk football and then they'd become a running with the ball and code of football, as in picking the ball up and running with it. That is true, it did go through that transition, but in the 1830s, it still hadn't gone through that transition. You still had to dribble it on the floor. So after William Webb Ellis had left, and after Matthew Blackson had left, you still couldn't pick up the ball and run with it. So, yeah, this is one hole in the narrative as well. These are not the only worrying points about this myth, about this narrative, about this story of the origin of rugby. These other question marks as well. And one of those question marks is on the boldness of the claim itself. Now, if we look at the plaque and the claim, or the bold claim, I should say, which it says on the plaque, you will see what I'm talking about. So this is the plaque which was erected in 1895, September 1895, outside of Rugby School. And it says, William Webb Ellis, who with fine disregard for the rules of football, as played in his time, first took the ball in his arms and ran with it. Thrust, originating the distinctive feature of the rugby game. So the bold claim here is distinctive feature. So it's a bold claim to say distinctive feature. And it's a bold claim to say distinctive feature because of the nature of folk football back in those days. Now, when I say folk football, I don't mean like association football. That's a codified game. What I mean is the football games before they got codified. It. So you're talking from like the 1700s up to the start of the Industrial Revolution, maybe a little bit further on. Now, the nature of these games worked a little bit differently than the codified games which we have today. They would have been organised on the day. So you would have set the rules on the day. You would have met up before the game happened and agreed to a set of rules. Now, not only this, the, they wouldn't have been played every single weekend like t you play football today. They would have been played on unique days. So you're talking like Shows Tuesday, you know, Pancake Day for the everyday man on the Clapham Omnibus. Boxing Day would have been another day. Um, May Day would have been another day as well. And you would have met up on these days and you would have organised a set of rules and then played the match. So what that means is that every single town, village, city had a different game of football. And not only did they have a different game of football, but they would change from unique day to unique day, from unique day. So what you're saying, or what this ball claim is saying, is that these thousands of football games, these thousands of full, um, 
these thousands of folk football games that existed, not one could you pick up the ball with up with your arms and run with it. You know, that's a very bold claim to make. And not only is it a bold claim, we've got examples of games which you could have done that with. One is in France and it's called um, Show, I think it's called. Um, so we know that's not true. Another one was in Wales where you would bend trees over and you could pick up the ball and run with it there and you had to kick the ball through the trees. So it's a bit like a mix between rugby and football today. So, so now that enough holes have been elucidated in this myth, I would like to, on a later date, go through why Matthew Bloxham wrote the article in 1877, or the reason I should say why I believe that he wrote the article in 1877. But that's a video for another date, and we're saying that, sayonara.